Hello, and welcome to CFUV's Climate Jam, a series on exploring technologies that can be used to combat global warming. My name is Jason Grenier, and I am producing a series of interviews on solutions to climate change with the assistance from the BC Sustainable Energy Association. Their website, bcsea.org. On the phone today, I have with me John Stonier. He is an entrepreneur and business consultant who has provided financial leadership to a wide spectrum of high-tech Canadian companies over the last 25 years in the areas of telecom, internet, renewable energy, and entertainment. Following his passion for a sustainable economy, he has acted in a range of advisory and leadership roles with the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association, BC Sustainable Energy Association, Vancouver Renewable Energy Cooperative, and Solar BC. John is also a member of the Vancouver Clean Tech CFO Group. About eight years ago, a newly purchased gas electric hybrid piqued his curiosity in full electric cars and has been John's passion ever since. He is the spokesperson and former director of the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association, VIVA, and has given scores of public presentations and media interviews on the topic of electric cars. He is a caretaker of Viva's 1912 Detroit electric car, a BC original, and through Viva, he has been active in shaping local public policy surrounding charging infrastructure. In 2012, he completed a five-year project to convert a 1999 Porsche Boxster to 100% electric drive with regenerative braking. When not in his electric sports car, he drives a Nissan Leaf. Hi, John, and uh, thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you. I'm just going to get right to it. Most of North America has an aging electrical grid, and the demand for electricity keeps going up. Proof of this is BC Hydro wants to build another hydroelectric dam. Other cities debate about whether or not to build a nuclear power plant and they don't close nuclear power plants that pass their life expectancies. It does not seem like North America has enough electricity to charge the millions of electric cars I assume you want to see on the roads. Uh, could you comment on this problem? Well, first of all, I think uh, your facts are wrong. The, in British Columbia, the demand for electricity has actually declined consistently over the last five years. And a lot of that is because people are actually uh, saving energy and making their homes more efficient and their businesses more efficient because efficient uh, use of energy is actually an economic benefit. And uh, we've seen a decline in, in uh, energy use consumption year over year. Now, if we were to take all of the cars in, in British Columbia, which is just about 3 million cars and, and light trucks, uh, and uh, convert them to electric, the actual increase in... Uh, electrical energy required would be an, an additional 18% over what we're using right now. And those are, those are numbers that BC Hydro has produced. 18% isn't all that much, considering we still have a long way to go in energy efficiency. And I can just briefly give you a couple examples. Every multifamily building in British Columbia today has hallway lights that stay on all the time, 24 hours, whether they're used or not. Parkade lights, the same way. There are huge wasted wastes of energy in our heating systems, electric baseboard uh, heating being one of the primary ones and one of the reasons why, B one of the reasons why BC's uh, grid has a very peculiar peak load uh, distribution. So what I'm saying is we have lots of electricity here. And if, if we were to put in occupancy sensors to take out the, uh, the extra light and electricity use we use uh, in our car cage today, and I did a study on this a few years ago, if you put occupancy sensor lighting in and you could save 75% of electricity, which shouldn't be a real big challenge, that 75% electricity uh, in this particular car cage was enough to power 50, uh, sorry, 33%, a third of all the cars 
in that parkade for a full year, which means actually the amount of electricity we need for electric cars is actually very small. And, um, and it's not unobtainable, uh, unobtainable within our existing generation capacity with a few more years of energy efficiency work. Okay, if we look at BC, that's one thing, but if we look at in most of the United States, and, and I know we have uh, in Canada also uh, coal burning uh, uh, plants. Uh, so basically, uh, when we have dirty electricity and we're charging our cars with that, is there a way to uh, avoid that? Uh, can, can wind and solar provide enough to charge our vehicles? The grid is greening all the time. That is a trend around the world. Uh, solar, wind, uh, and other renewable sources are, are cheaper in the long run than, than uh, any kind of fossil fuel-based generation. And that's also been proven out in uh, 2012 was the first year in, in uh, the United States that there were absolutely no coal, coal plants produced in the, and built in the, in, in the United States. And that's one of the reasons for that is because natural gas is, is cheaper. But now you also have wind and solar becoming uh, grid parity. So again, the sources of electricity for our grid is continually greening. In fact, from 2000 to 2009, the U.S. average dropped, uh, the, the carbon intensity dropped 25 percent from the standards that the uh, electrical generation uh, agency that tracks this in the states uh, has put out. So the grid is greening all the time. But Let's go back to, let's go take the dirtiest grid you can find in North America today, today, and that would be a state like Montana or Colorado or the province of Alberta, which is pretty well 90, 90% fossil fuel driven currently. Even with those grids, uh, because electric cars take so much less energy to do the same thing, they basically still produce uh, less upstream emissions than conventional car. So those are the facts. If we talk about batteries for a sec, uh, uh, lithium supply is expected to be tight by 2050, according to the European Commission study on critical raw materials. Furthermore, countries and companies are trying to create a monopoly on lithium. Uh, since lithium is highly reactive, uh, it is ideal for batteries. Uh, how can North America switch to electric cars if there is not enough lithium in the world f for the increase in car batteries? Lithium is thought to be a primary uh, ingredient for lithium-ion batteries. In fact, it isn't. The primary ingredient for lithium-ion batteries are the electrodes, which are of copper and aluminum, uh, with a little bit of a lithium paste uh, over the electrode. And uh, where we go on lithium-ion batteries uh, into the future is, is really an unknown there's so much new development happening that uh, the actual battery chemistry that we go forward with is hard to predict five years from now. But even given that, uh, so what I'm saying, there, there isn't that much lithium in lithium-ion batteries. It's mainly primary elements. So this is not really considered uh, a, a problem. The cost of producing lithium-ion batteries, while has been expensive, I believe the stats for the first quarter of 2012 was uh, with the, the capacity that had been built to that point in time, the wholesale cost of lithium-ion batteries had dropped 25%. So the market indications, what you're indicating in your question, I don't see as, uh, as what's actually happening. And we don't know where battery technology is going to go in the future. Lithium is probably the, and if you look at the periodic table of the elements, it's definitely one of the greatest elements to use in a battery because of, the, because of its atomic nature. But it's a great element, and it is relatively available. There are longer lead times in developing those resources, but so far the industry hasn't suffered for the amount of production at this point. Okay, so it doesn't seem, it seems like a problem we can overcome. Yes, and I think with, with new technology, we don't know what the electrode technology is going to be nano, nanostructures or... There, there's a whole bunch of new things coming on on stream, so it's not it's not even clear that lithium will be lithium ion batteries will be the the uh, battery uh, technology of the future. It, certainly, it is today, and it is the leading technology at this point. Okay, uh, I want to get to subsidies. I read an article in the Washington Times, March 18, 2013, that said electric cars cost nineteen thousand dollars more than traditional fossil fuel cars, and that 
the only reason people can afford electric cars is because taxpayers pay an average of seventy five hundred or sorry seven thousand five hundred dollars per car. The article also mentioned that subsidies for electric cars are running out. Can the electric car survive without government subsidies? Yes, it will. And here's here's my thoughts on that. First of all, any kind of new product technology introduction is always expensive when it was first introduced. 1983 PCs were $10,000. The iPod, when it was introduced in 2001, was $600. The cell phone in 1987 was a $3,000 product. And we all know that these things uh, come down drastically in price once they're in, in mass production and there's competitive production of them. And this will happen with electric cars. But there's an additional advantage of electric cars that really puts internal combustion engines at a disadvantage. And that advantage is it drastically reduced operating costs. The typical electric car driver today in Vancouver is saving $300 or more a month on operating costs. And that's the difference between the price of, of fuel and the cost of electricity to drive the same distance. That is a huge benefit to the consumer that is is quickly eaten up by any price differential. On the tax, and, and because of that, even, you know, so with those two factors involved with the, the um, price of cars going to come, to come down with mass production and that, that significant operating cost benefit, I don't see any problem with electric cars becoming dominant in the next few years. One note I would like to make, uh, I, I was hoping you would touch on it, is as I was reading this article, I was thinking that uh, both U.S. and Canada subsidize uh, the fossil, fossil fuel car industry, and they also subsidize fossil fuels which go into those cars. So myself, I don't see what's the big problem uh, subsidizing electric cars. Uh, well, there's, yeah, there's huge subsidies going to, um, in, there has been two, huge subsidies in the past. One of the subsidies is a, a drastic lowering of royalty costs to uh, extractive uh, industries such as fossil fuels, gas, and and oil in uh, in Canada, in BC here in 2009, the government uh, dropped royalties on natural gas by half, which is hundreds of millions of dollars that don't go into provincial coffers, which basically is in fact is a is a subsidy. So if you looked at the 2007 energy plan uh, that was hailed by the government of the day, the Gordon Campbell government of the day, as being progressively positive, if you looked at the, the amount of money that was going into the subsidies of that plan, $25 million went to renewable sort of innovative technologies, and there was something like uh, $220 million that was going directly to subsidize, you know, highway infrastructure and other infrastructure to support extractive natural gas and mining, or it wasn't actually mining, it was all, uh, oil and gas industries. So there is, there's huge examples of subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. And we know we have some, some serious uh, implications uh, of the results of that industry impacts on our environment and on our climate. Yeah. Let's get to range anxiety. Could you talk about range anxiety and the different types of charge stations that, if built, would help eliminate range anxiety? Well, sure. Range anxiety is, is sort of because there is in existing, most existing electric cars, their range is less than a, a full tank of gas in a gasoline car. Typically, 120 to 150 kilometers. Is, let's just call it 500 to 600 kilometers. Uh, the, the 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 other the flip side of that is it's much more easier to to recharge your car if if you're you know just charging up at home every night. Every time you come home and you can charge at night, it's it's very easy. You don't have to go out of your way when you're driving somewhere to actually stop and refuel your car because you've refueled your car while you're parking. And 95% of the time, for drivers who are driving in a, a typical urban commuter scenario, which is which is the majority of drivers, and the national average, whether you're in the United States or Canada, is 50 kilometers per day. So that's about you know a half to a third of the typical driving range of modern commercial EVs. So, so that meets most people's standards if they're just doing normal driving. Now, if you are a, a long-distance commuter and you're driving more than an hour each way, then you, an electric car is probably not for you at this point in time. And that's just, just the way it, it, it's, it's a little bit testing of uh, that's where anxiety comes in because there isn't 
even though we have electricity in virtually every building in North America, we don't have convenient uh, access to electricity in all of our parking spots. And that will take a while. However, there's certain areas of the country, just even in the interior of British Columbia, where there's block heating outlets in virtually, you know, most places you go to Prince George, you go to Calgary, you go to Edmonton, there's block heater outlets everywhere. And there's a ready source of electricity right by your car already. In Vancouver, we don't have that. And if you're if you do a lot of driving around or if you drive for your, your job and you're driving, you know, hundred and fifty or two hundred kilometers a day, then you have to plan your route to for a charging station. This is what causes range anxiety for those drivers who have to drive that much. And so in that case, it's a matter of setting up where you're, you know, planning your route. To offset that range anxiety, this is where the role of public charging stations comes in. Right now in British Columbia, we have 452 level two charging stations, which is the equivalent of a stove outlet or a dryer plug in your home. And you can recharge your car giving you about 20 kilometers to 40 kilometers worth of range per hour of charging. So for the most people, if you're driving, say, if you're driving 25 kilometers to work and driving home 25 kilometers and you're doing these typical 50 kilometers a day, you could basically charge and you could plug into a regular wall outlet at, at your work and you'd be basically recharged, fully recharged by noon each day within an eight-hour period uh, if you're just driving 25 kilometers. So so basically, even a basic wall outlet, if you're within the, the 50 kilometers a day, you're going to be driving your electric car basically full every time you leave your, either your home or your work, if you're allowed, if you can find a place to plug in at work. So the majority of us uh, electric cars might work for us today, and then maybe in the future we'll come up with different ways we can uh, drive long distance. And, uh, yeah, the next yeah. challenge is, is the inner city travel. Now, it's possible because, because there's slower time to charge, inner city travel is a little less convenient at this point in time. It's possible to drive with an electric car today from Vancouver all the way to Baja, California. There are charge stations all the way down uh, the I-5, and in a number of occasions there are fast charge stations, so-called DC fast charge, which give you a, a bulk charge and fill up your car basically in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There are 13 of those stations slated for BC that should be in by the end of this year, hopefully. Uh, there's been some delays in getting those, those installed, but they were announced last January by the BC government. And there's about, I think in the United States, or something in the order of 12, 600 or something of those fast charge stations that are being put in throughout the states. Okay. Uh, you also have a, the leading electric car manufacturer, Tesla, with their Model S vehicles, and Tesla has set up supercharged network that is uh, enabling fast charge locations, and they will have a supercharged station with, say, 10 bays, and uh, you can pull into any one of those 10 bays and, and recharge your Tesla within 30 minutes with their proprietary plug. So it only works for Teslas, but they've offered long distance, so you can drive up and down the coast. They, it's not complete yet, but uh, it, by 2015, they'll have a complete network they say across North America, so you'd be able to drive anywhere in North America for free on their through, through their supercharged network. Okay, well, you know what? There, there's a ton of things we haven't covered, but we're out of time. Is there anything else you want to mention? Uh, you know, anything we didn't touch on? Any websites that uh, you might want to direct people to? There's quite a bit. There's Plug in America. There's the Viva work, uh, Viva website. Uh, w e uh, sorry, uh, VEVA.ca. You can, just Googling electric cars, a few years ago there was a dearth of knowledge about uh, and information regarding electric cars. Now we see electric cars in the newspapers virtually every day. There's some new development, and uh, it's it's been actually quite amazing, the response to electric cars. And one of the th responses has been that uh, in comparison to the adoption of hybrids about 10 years ago, electric cars have run at twice the rate of adoption of, of hybrid vehicles, and I really do believe the main the main reason is not only the economics are so phenomenal, uh, but it's actually the performance and the the uh, the whole feel of electric car. Once you've driven one, and you realize how immensely powerful they are, how quiet and how smooth and luxurious they are. That is one of the big selling points that I believe that uh, once people actually start driving, get an experience with electric cars, and then they can see the potential savings per month. 
this is really going to uh, reach a tipping point in the next few years. Okay, excellent. Well, that's all we have time for. So thanks for joining us. Very good.